Hello, um, welcome to the second online workshop that we're doing for um, the third sector uh, from the UK Data Service. And today we're talking about data skills um, and what are survey data. Uh, so thank you um, for coming today. I'm quite excited to be here and telling you all about this. Um, so what we're covering today is I'm going to give a short introduction to the survey at the online um, workshops and what we're trying to achieve. Then I'm going to give a presentation um, about social surveys and secondary analysis. And then we're going to have a little bit of a quiz just to engage and see how everyone is and check understanding of um, the presentation. Then I'm going to give a demonstration of exploring some survey data using a tool we've got at the UK data service called Nestar. And then um, we've got a handout which hopefully has been emailed to you as well. So please check your email if you'd like the handout. Um, separately or if you can't get it from the go to webinar control panel um, but there will be 10 minutes or 15 minutes to do an activity in your own time then we'll come back and see how you got on with that discuss that and have any further questions and discussions so that's the general format for today so um, just quickly uh, the UK data service is funded by um, the ESRC the Economic and Re Social Research Council and it's a single point of access for um, secondary social science data. Um, so we hold all the data, a lot of the data that's produced um, by government funding uh, across the UK and some from further afield as well. We also hold all the census data. But as well as holding the data and providing access to it, we also have um, a whole range of support and training that we offer to people who are wanting to use the data. And so the objective of these workshops that I'm running is to um, sh promote our services and our resources and our data to members of the third sector. Um, and so it's not just an academic resource what we've got and um, we're really keen to get as many people using all the resources, um, as many people using it as possible. And so we want to increase understanding of how the data can be used um, by different people and in different ways and we want to support people to do that. And I think um, that we'll, through doing this, we'll be enabling people to provide evidence um, and enhance their knowledge and data skills. So just specifically why we want to do it with the third sector. Um, just as way of introduction as well, so I've only more recently moved into working um, for the university and the UK data service. For many years, I worked for Manchester City Council um, and before that, I've worked for various settings um, and, and volunteered in New Zealand and Australia, um, where I'm from. And I think that data is really important uh, when you're delivering uh, community services or delivering services um, to different groups across our communities. So lots of the services that I'm sure where you're from uh, run programs or deliver support to improve the outcomes for marginalised groups or you're trying to reduce inequalities um, and providing services often to those most in need. Uh, but these sorts of services rely on funding, often the funding is short term, and you need to be constantly proving that what you're doing is of value and is needed. And so I think that's where the UK data service can come in because some of the data that we hold can help provide the context to the work you're doing and demonstrate the need and demonstrate why um, the services are needed. But I am aware that there's a whole range of organisations out there um, doing all sorts of, uh, with all sorts of resources to, to provide that evidence. So it's, um, these workshops are very much introductory to try and provide that sort of um, starting point for how data can help with your services. Uh, the sort of data that we hold at the UK Data Service is quite varied. Um, last week we talked about aggregate data and census data. Um, today we're going to talk about micro data that comes from um, UK surveys. Um, but we also do hold um, some qualitative data and mixed method data. And um, there was a question that came after last week's workshop about that. And so next week in the final workshop, I'll try and um, round up some of the um, questions and comments that have come in from the feedback and address those as well when we're talking about um, using data to tell stories in, in the last workshop next week. And so just now to talk about um, social surveys. So what is survey data? And so survey data is a product of systematic 
data collection. Um, and it's quite typical for these data to be collected um, using a standard um, set of questions asked to a representative sample of people. Um, and so that produces microdata. So it's quite important um, when you're talking about rigorous social survey data that it was collected in a systematic way and the samples were representative because then you know that you can um, generalise the findings from that data to the wider population. So where do these sorts of surveys come from? They come from interviews. Often these are done face-to-face um, -face in people's homes, um, but more and more there's sort of mixed modes. A lot of the survey collection at the moment, um, because of the COVID-19 lockdown, has gone online or through the web. But typically people are asked um, questions, and it could be questions asked of the individual. It could be asked of households. Um, sometimes it's businesses or other units as well. So it's not just collected from individuals, but survey data comes from a wide range of sources. And so once those questions are answered, the information is collected from a number of respondents and the information is stored um, in records in a data set that can be used to produce statistical summaries. So each answer is put into a table and um, those tables are put into massive data sets which we can then analyse. And so just to give an example, I'm going to talk about the British Social Attitude Survey. Uh, so the British Social Attitude Survey has been going um, since 1983 and it is carried out to take an annual snapshot of public opinion on a range of key political and social issues. Uh, the survey is conducted by an organisation um, called NATSEN and um, the sort of information that comes from the the survey can be used to give opinions and is often picked up by the media, so such as um, same-sex marriages, austerity, and more recently Brexit. So that's the sort of questions that are asked through the British Social Attitudes Survey. And just as a bit more detail, it's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, um, as well as other sort of government departments and research foundations different um, think tanks or departments can sort of fund certain questions each year if there's a particular question like Brexit perhaps that they want to find out more about um, different departments will ask for that question to be put into the survey in any given year. Uh, it's a random selected households across Britain and one person then in each household is uh, selected um, randomly again and over, generally, like in 2018, there were 3,879 interviews. And these are personal one-to-one -one interviews, but they also followed up with a self-complete questionnaire. So in that self-complete questionnaire, there might be more sensitive questions that are answered. And then this is how we store the data at the UK Data Service. This is an example of the catalogue record for the British Social Attitudes um, 2018 survey. Um, and here you'll find all the information about where it was collected, how many people took part, um, who collected the data and what sort of questions were asked. And just to have a look at what that data actually look like, looks like when you download um, the, the data set, this is an example of what the National Food Survey, this is an open data set, um, looks like and this is in our studio. So data in this format is typically referred to as microdata as the records relate to the original data collection units. So if a survey gathers responses from individuals, the record will be for individuals too. So the generic term for a unit is called a case. So each row across here is a case. And you can see on the, um, on the side up here, there's 6,699 cases. That's what that observation means. So that's how many rows of data there are here, which is why you need a package like R or SPSS to um, do the analysis. And then the variables are stored across the top in the columns. And again, you can see here there's 53 variables. And the um, individual sort of unit where that kind of um, crosses over is the value. So the value of, for that case and that variable is what's highlighted in each individual box. So that's what the data looks like. Um, and just to talk a little bit about the value of secondary analysis as opposed to collecting your own um, survey data. So 
we have what we call data collectors and then we've got the secondary analysts and so on the left here we've got example of some data collectors so big organizations like the office of national statistics or natsen as we talked about um, other sort of projects like understanding society which um, might run out of universities um, the photo there is of peter townsend who's a qualitative researcher who did quite a lot of research around poverty so this, this, these are all people or organizations that do primary research and they uh, collect the data and they normally do some analysis of it for a specific planned purpose. But then um, if they are prepared to share the data, um, it makes it available for secondary analysis. And so we hold lots of that data which people can access for their analysis. Um, and then so that's called um, doing secondary research. So you're reanalyzing the data. So you might be sort of reanalyzing it for a similar purpose, or you might have a whole different research question that you're applying to the same data that was collected. Um, and I've got a picture here of um, a blog that was recently produced using understanding um, society data. Um, and it was produced uh, by um, National Voices about putting um, older people um, and older people and COVID-19. So it was using the Understanding Society data to help understand their experiences. So that's just one example of how data can be used in secondary analysis. Um, so there are some pros and cons of using secondary data. Um, firstly, the big pros is that um, some of these data sets would be impossible to create um, on your own or for a small community organization or a small charity um, to produce some of the data on these on this level would be impossible you're talking you know, thousands it's um, these are multi-million pound um, surveys um, and so and it, despite that some people you know lots of organizations do complete their own surveys and even completing a small survey is um, quite can be quite costly so it can be quite cost effective to use secondary data that might be able to answer your research or your, your problems or the, the question that you're trying to explore. Um, there's lots of ethical issues around data collection as well, but when you complete secondary analysis, all those um, ethical issues have already been dealt with. So um, you don't need to worry about um, disclosing individuals because all the data will be anonymized. Um, so you don't need to recontact any of the people um, who the data was collected from. They've all already agreed that they know that the data will be passed on in an anonymized way. Um, so you can reuse data by others, um, but you can make your own claims on it though still. So um, I mean these data sets are huge, so there's all sorts of questions that um, can be answered using them. But some of the cons attached to it is that um, you don't know um, how and why the data was collected or how or how the data set was built. So you have to do quite a lot of you have to put in quite a lot of effort to get to know the data and understand um, how it was all put together. Um, so and there's still some ethical issues that need to be considered because it may limit what data you can access. Um, I don't go into it too much today really, but there are different ways in which you can access data from the UK Data Service. So lots of our data sets you can just log in once you're registered and download. Um, but then sometimes we have different versions of data. So some of the more sensitive data like low level geography or anything that's going to be using a small group of people or applied to a small group of people will be limited um, to perhaps secure access. And so you have to go through a whole other process to access that data. Um, and you know the data may not exactly match your research questions, um, so you have to sort of think about how you can use it. You know, it's, sometimes it's a bit of a compromise, bit of a compromise, um, and you can't make the studies any longer. You can't kind of add more questions onto it. So, but you need to sort of um, the two things to remember from this is that you just need to make an effort to understand the data. And you also need to be a bit pragmatic about um, whether the data are good enough for your purpose. We often get questions coming through our help desk here saying, you know, I want, I want to answer exactly this. And we have to sort of reply saying, well, we don't have that exact, um, anything that exactly matches that, but perhaps you can sort of think about rephrasing your problem a bit um, so that the data that we do have will be able to work for you. So how you go about doing um, a bit of research when you're doing secondary analysis is that you think of what your question or your problem is. What is it that you're trying to address? 
and then you locate some data that you think will help answer that problem. And then you evaluate the data, so you start to explore it and think, is this exactly what I want? And then you carry out your analysis. So it's kind of a um, sort of a linear process, um, only it's, it's not really, because you might locate the data and then you'll think, well, actually, that doesn't really have the questions in it that I want. So you might go back to your question or your problem and start to sort of rephrase it or try to locate um, a different set of data. And the same thing might happen when you come to evaluating the data, you know, you look into it a bit more, and it's at that point that you realise that it doesn't quite um, align with what you were hoping so much. So you might have to go back to your question or go back to the data, try and find some different variables within it. Um, and the same thing might happen when you get to analysis. So it's kind of an um, iterative process and you might have to go, go forward and backwards a bit to, until you kind of get to the data in a way that you want it and can find the right data for your problem or question. So to make sense of your data and to understand if it is suitable for research, you must understand what information was collected, who it was collected from, where and where when and where it was collected, um, and how the data might have been changed before it was archived with us at the UK Data Service. And all this information is in um, the documentation that comes with the data. Um, I showed you before the catalogue record. Uh, there's another tab along from the catalogue record where well, after you've accessed the data, which gives you all the documentation. The documentation can be quite um, comprehensive. Um, there can be lots of very long documents, uh, but the answers are in there. And we're here to help understand that documentation if um, you can't find the answers you're looking for. Um, so just before I go into looking at some of our data, I just want to go over some simple statistics. So just to first talk about different types of variables. Um, so there's mainly the main two types of variables are interval variables, which are on a continuous scale. So something like age that just is continuous and doesn't, you know, there's no gaps in between each answer. And then there's categorical variables. Um, and we can think of two main types of categorical variables. We've got nominal variables that have no natural order. So that could be something like your favorite color. Um, and then ordinal variables, which are naturally ordered. So um, something that's like on a scale of one to five, how much, um, you know, your, how, how good are you feeling today on a scale of one to five? That, that sort of thing. So here are some examples of these sorts of questions. So the first one is um, that nominal, nominal sort of variable. So no natural order. What type of school does your oldest child attend? And so there's just different types of school, and you know they're not in an order. The second one is uh, going back to the ordinal variables. So it's a scale, um, and oh, there should have been a one there under the side completely satisfied. You often see these are called Likert scales. So uh, often one to five or one to four, going from one end of being completely satisfied to completely dissatisfied in this example. And the last one is a continuous uh, variable. So how much did your family pay in school fees in the previous year? And, you know, so there'll be any answer there from zero through to thousands, um, I imagine, across the country. Um, and there's different ways of describing uh, these sorts of variables. So for the continuous or the interval variables, um, because there they can be the many, many, many different answers, we don't look at the individual numbers. We look at things like the mean or the average or, or the, the most common um, answer would be the mode. Um, we look at how it varies you know, across the distribution. Is it a, a standard distribution or is it not? Um, and then we often visualize them with histograms because they're an easy way to see what the pattern is. For categorical variables, though, we can use counts, um, and then also percentages, because when counts get big, it's um, nice to see what a percentage is, and we often put them in tables. So I'm just going to have a little look at um, tables. This is an example of a two-way table. So, um, and here we've got down one side, um, a category of for age, so whether someone's under 18 or over 18. And then up the top um, in the columns, we've got what time do you normally get out of bed? Um, this is just an example that I just completely made up. Um, so 
and in this example it's important to realize that the percentages are going down the columns so it's important to look at where the 100 percent is normally it's often in columns but you might see it across the rows as well um, so you could look at the individual counts which is the number not in brackets so you can see um, that if we look at the column um, here on the on the end we can see that there were 60 uh, people under 18 and 60 people over 18 so half the sample um, from each group and so 120 altogether but then out of those 60 people under 18 40 said they got out a bed after 9 a.m and 20 said they got out um, before 9 a.m so you can see that that's not what the 29 and the 80 percent relate to because you know that doesn't add to 100 percent so the percentages are going down the columns so what we're doing here is comparing this um, question so we're comparing when did what who, who gets out of bed after 9 a.m and we know that 80 percent of um, younger people get out of bed after 9 a.m from this sample but only 20 percent of those over 18 so that's what we're comparing in this column when we're doing it down the down the column to compare that so now we're just going to have um, a little quiz but um, just to see uh, answer some questions from the presentation but before I do that I just want to point out as well that in your um, go to webinar control panel which hopefully you can all see um, you might need to expand it with an orange arrow if you can't see it all but there should be a questions drop down box so if you have any questions you can pop them in there as you're thinking about them and we'll answer them um, as we go along if you have any problems we can put them in there as well or any technical problems um, pop your questions in there um, we'll answer most of them at the end in the discussion but if there's anything that comes up feel free to put it in the questions box um, right well I think we'll do uh, we've got just three questions to ask you now um, about that presentation so we'll put um, those up and, and see how we got on so the first one what is survey data so survey data is um, select what you think is it individual level data is it data collected over time or is it uh, summary data about populations groups or regions thank you so we've got most of you said 79% said um, individual level data, so it's micro data, so that's the answer um, I was looking for. Um, data collected over time, I mean surveys can be collected over time. Um, that sort of survey um, would normally call longitudinal data. And summary data about populations, groups or regions, that's when you aggregate the data um, and that's what we covered last week. Um, so yep, that's, that's great. Um, the next question what is secondary data analysis yeah so it's reusing data collected by someone else um, that, that's that's the answer I was looking for we've got a second report produced from a social survey so I mean you might have it, it, it could be that but it's that's the end product as opposed to um, what the actual process is so yeah so secondary data analysis is reusing data generally collected by someone else I think we've got one final question um, here just to see how we're getting on. Which of the following is an example of a categorical variable? But more um, different answers here. So um, I was looking for um, the, num the number of people living in a house. So um, it's going to be a category. So it's either going to be I guess it could be sort of continuous but it's going to be sort of defined um, household income is continuous you know money is on a continuous scale you know the household income can it's not a, in a category people could put that would be an answer in a survey that people could put a specific answer to and it's going to be along a, a scale so um, an age of the oldest person in the house is the same that's going to be over a lot longer scale so um, the number of people living in a house um, is is more like a categorical variable maybe that wasn't the best example there but um, yeah that's great so um, now um, will you share the slide did you want me to put the slide up um, yeah if you I'll just answer this question because um, 
I think it's probably relevant. So if you categorize age, then age of the oldest person can be a category. Yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah. So you, it depends how the question was asked. It probably depends. The question here was asked if you categorize age, then you of the oldest person, then it would be a categorical variable as well. So yes, so it depends what the answers were, sort of saying if um, how old was the oldest person in the house, and if you had like bands, you know, so you'd made categories out of age, so you had like, uh, is the oldest person in the house, and between 25 and 35, 35 and 45, um, yes, that would be a categorical variable for age. So it's one of the things you often have to do in surveys with survey data to tidy it up. You might get a continuous variable for age, that's very common, and one of the things you'd have to do is put it into age bounds. Um, to, to make it into a categorical variable so that you can do things like produce your two-way tables and um, your your bar charts and things like that. So, um, so yes, so, so maybe that was a good example to put in as a question because it kind of helps make you think about um, the variables in different ways and how you're going to use them. And we will see that a bit more as well in um, the demonstration that I'm about to uh, give now. Um, and there's just a question there as well from Ella about um, will we be sharing the slides afterwards and yes we will, they'll be um, emailed up but they'll also be up on the website. I think actually we might just email out the um, um, link to the slides on the website. So now um, I'm just going to move on and do a quick demonstration of one of the tools we've got um, at the UK Data Service called Infuse. Um, and this uh, is a tool that you can use to explore uh, some of the survey data that we have online. So you don't need to have a tool like R or SPSS. Um, you can just get some of the statistics straight through our website um, online. Because um, just to make the point as well, most of these survey data sets that we have, um, you can't open up in Excel. Um, the data is too large and it doesn't generally come in that sort of format. So um, you really do need one of the bigger sort of software packages to do um, the more in-depth analysis with it. But you can do quite a lot with um, Nestar online. So this is the UK Data Service website homepage. From here, if you go to Get Data and then Explore Online, you find um, the different tools that we have for exploring data online. Um, I just want to note that I've already logged into the website. Um, you don't need to be logged into the website to go to Nestar, but um, it helps. I'll, I'll, I'll point out in a bit where, where it helps. So this is the website address for Nestar. It's got its own sort of separate page, and this is what it looks like. Um, hopefully, uh, the screen is big enough for you. Just put a comment in if it's not, and I'll zoom it in a little bit more. Um, but you can see the interface for Nestar um, looks like this, so it's quite, um, I think it's quite industrial really actually. Um, so, it, but there's a lot of data in here, so it needs to sort of be done in quite a sort of structured way. So down the left hand side is where our um, navigation is. And you can see um, here we've got research data sets, and if I um, open that up, these are not all the data sets that we have, but the, all the ones that we've got available to view on Nestar. So it's a lot of our main key data sets are available here, and you can um, explore the data through them. Um, and then we've got uh, unrestricted access teaching data sets. Um, and then there's a wider range of teaching data sets as well. So I'm going to use one of the teaching data sets now just for this demonstration, um, just because it's um, an easier way of doing it, so a smaller data set. So you use the little crosses and minuses on the sides to expand and drop down these um, various categories. Um, sorry, well, I think... Patty, we've just had a request to make the screen slightly bigger. Yeah, I just um, saw that. I just will say, if anyone's still struggling, you should be able to shrink the size of Patty's camera at the top as well by dragging the little um, oh, line on the, the screen. Oh, now that reminded me, I was going to turn my webcam off for this part, so that just to make the screen better. So hopefully, hopefully that's made it a bit easier to see. It's great. Um, so yeah, so I've expanded down from the um, unrestricted access data, and I'm looking at the teaching data sets. I'm going to click on here um, the crime survey for England and Wales. 
Um, and so when I click on that title, up here on the main part of the website, you get a description about the Crime Survey for England and Wales. So it tells you a bit about it, what it measures, what's its purpose. Um, and then if you look down um, here, it tells you the actual data set. And so this is the 2007-2008 um, unrestricted access teaching data set. And it gives you an abstract specifically about um, this data set. So it tells you what's different between the teaching data set and the main data set um, and what topics were covered in it. And so then we've got metadata and um, variable descriptions. So the metadata is more like uh, the supporting, some of the supporting information for the study. So we're more interested in the variables. So we're going to look at variable descriptions. And then it's got um, some top level categories of the different variables that are available in here. And so uh, the Crime Survey for England and Wales um, collects experiences of crime, but also uh, it collects um, fear of crime, attitude towards the police force, um, feelings around antisocial behaviour. And then, as most of our social surveys do, they also collect a whole lot of information about the individuals who are filling in the surveys, so demographic information about people. Um, and so I'm going to look here at fear of crime as an example. And these are all the questions down the side here that were asked about fear of crime. So you can see there's quite, quite a lot. Um, there's about a dozen questions there asked about how worried you are about certain things. Um, how safe you feel. Um, and we're going to look at this question here. So how safe do you feel walking alone after dark? And um, this is what I think is quite um, cool about Nestar is so you can click on that question and straight away you've got um, a statistic here um, telling you uh, what the feelings about walking home after dark are. So um, I'm just going to note at this point as well um, that I'm not going to talk about waiting or wait any of the data today. There is an option to do that. Um, and I will send some information around um, next week about waiting. Um, but today we're just exploring it and looking at the data. So this isn't uh, weighted results, but they are still, they'll be fairly representative of um, the population. For, so England and Wales from where they were collected. So you can see here we've got the exact numbers. We've got some summary statistics under here. So we know that this was a sample of 11,625 people. And this is how many responded to each of this, um, each of these variables. So you can see this is an ordinal, um, categorical variable. Um, and then we've got the percentages on the side as well. You know, because those are quite big numbers, it's quite nice to have the sort of simpler percentages to understand it. So when asked, um, I'm just up here, so this is the, the, the name of the variable is often something short and sometimes it doesn't make much sense, but this one is um, walk dark, that's the name of the variable. And the label is normally sort of like a summary of the question, so how safe do you feel walking alone after dark? But here we've got the actual, what that's called the literal question, so it was how safe do you feel walking alone in this area after dark? Would you feel, um, you know, very safe, fairly safe, a bit unsafe? or very unsafe. And so um, we can see that most people feel fairly safe. Um, they don't feel, um, yeah, so that they're not feeling very safe, um, there's, but there's very few that are feeling very unsafe. So it's a quick way of looking at um, a statistic about a specific fact. And so if you think about all the different surveys that we've got and all the different questions that go down to this sort of level, you can see that you can easily find probably something that puts context on the sort of work that you're doing. So, um, so you might be working around safe neighbourhoods or um, the British Social Attitude Survey is quite good. That's in Nestar as well and you can go in and find out and views and opinions on all sorts of things. And so you could quickly drop a percentage or a statistic in from here into a report that you're writing or a blog post that you're writing um, and you know that that's a representative statistic um, of uh, the population as a whole. But you might want to be a bit more specific, like this is where the two-way tables come into it. So you can see at the top here we've got description, tabulation and analysis. 
So I'm going to click on tabulation and then you can see a blank two-way table comes up. And so I'm going to click again on how safe do you feel walking alone after dark and I'm going to put that in my rows. Um, and see that thing that just came up, just flicked up there and then it stopped. That was saying you need to be logged in to do this. And so because I've already logged in, um, it, it let me go past that screen. Otherwise it would have asked me to log in. Um, but just to make you aware that Nesta can be a bit unstable when you try to log in in Nesta. So that's why um, in the exercise when you come to do it next the activity, you'll see that I've asked you to log in before you go to Nesta, log in from the main UK Data Service website. Um, and then you're less likely to encounter problems once you're exploring data in Nesta. And just to say, if you haven't managed to register um, yet, um, and I apologise if you haven't, I know it's not a, a straight border or necessarily an instant process for people um, who aren't uh, in a registered sort of institution with the UK Data Service, you'll still be able to explore the statistics like I was just doing. Um, you just won't be able to do the two-way tables and the activity. But going back to this two-way table, so now I've put um, how safe do you feel into this more tabular form. Um, but I want to explore that a bit more. So I want to sort of maybe think how does that um, how does that uh, fit? How does that contrast when you look at gender, perhaps or age? And so I'm going to look at some different variables. So I'll go um, up a bit further here to the socio-demographic variables and I open that and um, you can see there's things here around um, gender, age, marital status, um, ethnicity, education, um, whether that you're in work or not. So we could compare it by any of those variables. Um, and I was thinking of doing it um, by age. I thought that might be quite interesting. But then this is a good example of why you can't really put um, age, which is a continuous variable, into a cross tab. Um, so if I click on age and I say, well, I want to put age in the columns, you'll see that across the top there were respondents from age 16 right across, you know, up to um, 101. Um, so that's not, that's very hard to interpret unless we're specifically interested in 50-year-olds and we want to look at 50-year-olds and work out what their, um, their fear is. Um, so of walking alone. So that variable isn't a good one for us to be putting in a two-way table because it's um, got too many categories because it's not really a categorical variable, it's a um, continuous variable. So we can look at that in different ways though and I will show you that um, shortly. Instead, um, I'm going to remove that one here. So um, I'll remove that from the table and take it back to that and we'll put in gender instead. So I'll add sex to the columns and it will tell us in the columns um, how people feel about walking by gender. So now you can see we've got gender at the top um, and the answer to the other question down the side. And as you could probably predict, um, it's telling us quite an interesting story. So uh, like before, we can see we've got the 100% down the bottom. This is a percentage, um, and we could change that there to the, um, we could change the percentages to go the other way, um, which is just something to bear in mind when you're doing the activity if your answers don't look perhaps like how you expect. You can also see the raw numbers if you just wanted to see the count. But we're looking at the percentages and the columns. So you can see how safe do you feel walking in the dark? Um, Men um, feel um, very safe, 38.8% um, of them, as opposed to females, women, who um, only 15% of them said that they felt very safe. And looking at the other end, 17% um, of women said they felt very unsafe um, when only 4% of men did. So you can see there's quite a different um, story going on there. And I just wanted to show you um, one more thing. Up here there's an icon for graphs and so if I select that and there's a little drop down menu um, and so I'm going to select the second bar graph and we can, I'll have to zoom that out 
um, you can see I've put that into a, um, a graph and you can see from here there's two quite different pictures, um, the same question but a very different distribution for males and females. So you can see males are much more here on the very safe side and women are much more in the middle. Um, and you know they're, they're not they're not very feeling very safe or necessarily very unsafe, but um, much more so towards the unsafe side than males. Um, this little uh, it's very these icons up here are quite small, unfortunately. This one here which clears it, so I'm just going to clear that and just um, put this age one back into um, the columns just to show you that. Uh, you know, it doesn't look very good in a table, but again, we can put that into a bar graph. And maybe um, I will um, just reduce the size of that so you can see. Oh, can't zoom that up for some reason. And it shows you the distribution. Hmm. Oh, it's not zooming out, but you can see the distribution of. Um, Age. This is the age respondents from the Crime Survey for England and Wales. So it starts at 16, so you can see there's a few there who are younger and then it's a fairly sort of even distribution across um, uh, the middle age group. Fewer here, um, often you find in social surveys around this age, um, middle age, you know, 50s, um, mid, mid, mid 40s, mid 40s to sort of 60 it's harder sometimes to capture those people because they're busy people out working full time um, and so they're harder to capture for social surveys that are often less likely to respond um, and then it goes down with age. But that's the sort of thing, this age distribution, which might be adjusted with the weights if you are using weights. Um, but that's just to show you the distribution of that continuous variable. Um, so I think that's that's about where I was going to show you for the demonstration of Nestar. So um, now we will um, move on to um, the activity. So hopefully you've all managed to hold, get a hold of the handout. So there's a um, handout which should look something like this. Again, it's in the GoToWebinar control panel under handouts. Um, and it was emailed to you um, around lunchtime today as well. And I do, I've made a couple of comments last week, I, mean, I do appreciate it's a bit hard um, having a PDF handout while you're trying to do an activity on um, an online tool as well. Um, so just, a, just a, a little tip in case you don't know, I use um, Alt-Tab a lot or I'm on a um, Mac so it's Command-Tab. So if you hold down the command or alt key and then tab, um, you can uh, switch through between the screens um, quite quickly. So if you have it set up, you can switch between the PDF and Nestar to follow the instructions that way. So it's just a little tip if um, that helps because I know it can be a bit tricky. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to work through the handout instructions. Um, you can post questions in the um, question box on GoToWebinar as you're doing it. Um, you know, I'll still be here while you're doing this and can address any questions that come up or any problems. Um, so just work through the exercise in your own time. There's some questions throughout the handout and we'll come back together at the end um, to answer those questions. So jot down the answers that you get um, and we'll come back together at 3pm to answer those questions um, using the polls and then have a few more, um, a bit of a wider discussion, answer any more questions that you have. So um, that's what we're going uh, to do now. So if you want to start um, your activity, and we'll come back together at three o'clock. This has been a question about how to locate Nestar um, from the data service website once you're logged in. Um, I can just demonstrate that again. There is a link on the handout as well that will take you straight to the Nestar um, page, but um, from the UK Data Service website, um, if you go Get Data and then Explore Online, um, Nestar is the first option there. So that's from the UK Data Service website homepage, Get Data, Nestar. And then that's the web address there.
Okay, I think we're going to um, come back together now. We're going to answer some questions first to see how you all got on. Um, so here are our questions. So um, firstly, I'm just um, hoping uh, most of you completed the activity. So we're just going to ask a quick question to see how many of you managed to um, complete the activity or at least do most of it. Um, so about about a third of you got right through to the end maybe by the looks of it. So that's good to know maybe um, I'll give a bit more time next time. Um, sorry if you didn't get to the end of it or if you had problems um, registering or finding Nesta. Um, it can all be a bit uh, uh, complicated to find all the bits that you need to find but you have that activity um, sheet with you now so hopefully you'll be able to finish that um, in your own time um, and hopefully most of you got as far as the first couple of questions so how many respondents from the Health Survey for England reported having a physical or mental health condition or illness lasting or expected to last 12 months or more I'm, I'm glad most of you got this right because I'm looking at this thinking I didn't actually write these answers down so I'm just going to go with the majority here, which looks pretty clear. Um, so we've um, got 3,914, so, so that's right. So out of the 10,067, um, actually I think I've got um, the slide here. So um, 10,067, that's the number of total um, respondents in the sample, all the people in the survey. And so out of them, about a third, just over a third, um, close to 40%, said that they had some sort of physical or mental health condition that was had lasted or they expected to last for 12 months or more. So that's the answer to the first um, question. So if we just go um, back, how many people reported that that condition affected stamina, breathing or fatigue? So you probably noticed in the survey they then break that down so they say, do you have a condition and then they're like and what sort of condition it is we're interested in what sort of condition you have so how many of those um, had a condition that uh, affected um, their stamina breathing or fatigue and these are the sort of simple statistics that you should be able to get up without um, without needing to register just by clicking on the variable it will show you what the um, what that distribution of that answer is, and so you've got one thousand one hundred and fourteen. So um, that's right. So three thousand and ninety eight. That was the total number of people with um, any sort of condition. So two thousand was the number um, of people that didn't have one a stamina, breathing, or fatigue condition. And so one thousand and fourteen were the number of people in the sample who had a stamina, breathing or fatigue um, long-term condition. Um, and so now we're looking at those respondents with conditions affecting their stamina, breathing or fatigue. So what percentage are in the lowest income quintile? So if you manage to get as far as the cross tab, and so you could look at income quintiles and break that down by people with um, conditions, how many um, were in the lowest income quintile? So there was a bit of explanatory note in the um, handout. So your know, quintile is when we just, we, uh, you have the continuous variable for income and you divide it into five even categories. So you can split the sample amongst the, the lowest um, fifth and the highest fifth. Often you'd compare the extremes um, just to sort of show the, that would be the most extreme way of showing any sort of um, income inequality. Um, and so this one you've got most people with the correct answer there. So it was the 30.7% um, had um, were in the lowest quintile. And I'll just have a look here because this is when I've been talking about cross tabs and looking at um, percentages and columns versus um, versus rows. So this one here is the table that you should have come up with. So we can see. Um, if I can get my pointer over there, 30.7 and the lowest quintile at the top there um, mentioned that they had one of those conditions. If you'd done it the other way around, so the instructions asked you to put the quintiles in the rows and the condition in the columns. If you'd done it the other way around and put the conditions um, in the rows and the quintiles in the columns, you would have got percentages by columns instead. 
and um, that is where you would have got uh, sort of some of these different sort of percentages. So the 40.4% um, is there as the lowest quintile, but that's not actually answering um, the question. That's looking at in the lowest quintile, how many people with a long-term condition had a um, condition that affected their fatigue um, or breathing. Um, so that's 40% of the lowest quintile. Um, and that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the difference between um, having that condition or not having that condition across the quintiles. So that's why you needed a table that looked like this in order to answer um, that specific question. Um, and now I'm just going to answer the, the last question. So compared to all long-term health conditions, are conditions affecting stamina, breathing or fatigue more prevalent or less prevalent among people in the lowest income quintile. You got that far and you've all got that, um, mostly all got that right. So um, that's when we're starting to interpret the results. So we're looking at this um, table again and um, we're looking at that 30.7% and we're sort of saying is that um, it, it's more prevalent. So if you look at the total column, that's telling you the distribution of um, the um, people with long-term illnesses altogether. So in general, 24% of um, the lowest quintile have um, some sort of condition, but actually 30% um, uh, of those in the lowest quintile, that is one of those sorts of um, fatigue or breathing um, conditions. Compared to people in the highest quintile, 14% you know, of people in the highest quintile um, have a long-term condition. So already we can see um, some sort of uh, economic gradient to um, health there. But even then, um, only 10% of those in the highest, or oh, that's the second highest, no, the highest quintile, um, have a, um, only 10% have a breathing or fatigue uh, issue. Um, so there are other conditions. So these sorts of breathing um, fatigue uh, conditions and stamina conditions are more likely to be um, experienced from those in lower income. So, and that answers the research question around risk factors for COVID-19. Um, you know, you're more likely to have adverse side effects from it if you've got a pre-existing condition, particularly one that kind of affects your breathing. And so, um, therefore, you're also more at risk if you're in one of the lower income brackets because you're more likely to have those conditions. So that helps frame um, some sort of, uh, if, if, you're, if you're doing work in that sort of area where you're trying to support people with long-term conditions or you're trying to support people who are um, on lower income, you, you know, this is how you can sort of frame some of your arguments about why you're wanting to do this sort of work. So um, that's where we're with that. And I just, there was one last little thing on the activity sheet to show that in a graph. So you might have come up with a graph that looked like that. Um, and that's sort of showing it, um, you know, graphically again, which I think, you know, it just paints a stronger picture. So you can see here that um, overall uh, people that don't have uh, one of these conditions, it's, it's kind of even, it's, slightly lower for those in the highest quintile. But um, when you're people who do have these conditions, they're much more likely to be in those lower income brackets. So it's a much clearer way of showing that. Um, someone asked in the questions if you can, um, you know, export these, these graphs. So, um, I mean, I did that for this presentation. I just, I just took a screenshot of it. Um, and pasted it into my presentation. Um, and you can do the same, or you can right-click on it when you're in Nestar and you copy the image and paste it into your report. Um, you can see the quality is um, reasonably good. So, um, you know, you can do that. Um, I would just say you should be citing, obviously, the source of your data. Um, and if you go to the UK Data Service catalogue page for that data set, it gives you a reference in there which you can use and just paste straight in to, to cite where that data came from. So now we're going to um, move on to any sort of wider discussion. So if you have questions, um, put them in the question box. Um, Ali will read them out to me. Oh, are the copied graphs accessible to screen reader users? That's a really good question um, that's come from Matthew. I'm not exactly sure of the answer, um, 
but I do know that the UK Data Service is uh, currently uh, ensuring as much as possible that um, the website is entirely accessible um, under the new sort of legislation that's coming in force um, later in the year. So um, most of our website will be. There's some things like the tools, um, like Nestar. Um, I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to make that um, accessible with a screen reader. Um, but I can, I can get back to you on that, Matthew, if you like, um, and find out for you. Because, um, again, I'm not sure if the copied graphs are accessible or not. Um, but we can take that question away and get back to you on that. Um, does anybody else have any questions or want to, um, if you raise your hand, um, oh. we can... Um, oh. oh, sorry. We've got one, Patty, that says, um, in the cross-tabulation, is it possible to get the p-value, i.e. the chi-squared test? Yeah, I think that is. Um, I don't often um, do that sort of level of analysis um, in, um, in uh, Nesta. I would normally be in uh, another program like R or SPSS to do that. But um, I'm pretty sure you can. And see, there's a further tab here um, for analysis. I mean, you can actually run um, some regressions. Oh, you know more about this, Ali? Um, no. No, no, I don't think so. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> um, so you can, uh, you do have, you don't have any of the statistics down there, but um, there is, it does give you the statistics when you do the regressions, or also if you did the correlation, you'll get the statistics in there as well. So um, there is a further um, uh, you know, statistical tests, which the information will be available. Um, but I actually, I can follow that one up for you as well, um, Pfizer, and um, get back to you just to give a more exact answer. We do actually have a few guides as well, which I can also share um, on the UK Data Service um, website. Um, uh, I'll just show you quickly where some of these guides are. Uh, last week I showed it in the screenshots, but I'll um, do it here today. So under use data, um, so we're under get data to find, to explore the data and to actually get the data, but under use data is where you'll find all our support and resources. And so under here there's like guides and video guides. Um, so the guides are all PDF guides. Um, so, uh, and so it's methods and stuff where guides to exploring online. Um, so there'll probably be stuff in here around, um, well there's not one about Nesta, but there's definitely videos about Nesta. Um, and we've got a whole YouTube channel, so if you can log on, we don't just log on to YouTube, if you click through to the YouTube channel, you'll find um, all our videos, and there's a whole little set of videos about exploring Nestar, which will give you um, some more demonstrations of how it can be used. And I'll just point out down here while I'm here as well, there's um, our data skills modules, and we have a whole data skills module on survey data. Uh, that takes about two hours to complete, and it goes through everything I've talked to talked about today in a bit more detail. Um, it doesn't use Nestar though, and um, for examples, it does use SPSS, um, or there is a free version called PSPP which you could use as well. So um, that is worth exploring as well if you want to uh, find out more about what we've been talking about today. I think there's another question. There is a way to search for variables. Oh, that's right. Someone asked about searching for variables. But we do have um, on our website uh, um, variable and question bank. It's not um, it's not updated as much as it used to be, but because lots of the surveys have run for a long time and lots of the surveys use the same variables year on year or wave on wave of data collection because um, that means you can compare the variables over time. Um, and so, yeah, and so if you go here from the uh, UK Data Service homepage to get data, you see this box comes up here, um, the variable and question bank. And so you can click on that, um, and then you can type in whatever variable it is that you're interested in. So um, I don't know if this will come 
up or not yet but so he's there walking alone um and yeah so then it got these questions about people afraid to walk alone in the area where they live so that's that question that we just looked at well that says it's from the english longitudinal study of aging you'll find some questions are asked um in different surveys and it's the same question um and that's because lots of these questions are written in a way which is um you know validated and, and so it's asked in a way that they know it is going to get a, a fair answer, um, which is another good reason to use secondary data because you know we, all the questions have been thought about and, and developed in such a way um, that it's given a proper representative answer from uh, the population. So this is a good place to look for questions, even if you are doing your own survey. Um, if you use some of the questions that are standardised here, you could even then compare your own survey with your service users to a nationally representative one to kind of uh, look at the differences or similarities. So this variable and question bank can be used um, for all sorts of ways. But you'll see here that you can even, um, straight from the variable and question bank, you can open it up and find the responses um, to that question there, which doesn't give you the percentages or anything, but um, you can explore further and look, you know, all, insta all instances of this variable, or once you've found the variable, you can then look for it. So you know that this was in the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. So you could look that up in Nestar and find the variable that way. So if you just want to do a bit of a search about what sort of things you can ask or how things are asked, then I'd definitely recommend looking at the um, variable and question bank and uh, exploring that a bit.